you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Okay. Um, so everyone wants to know about the ferry, Alaska class ferry, and I thought I'd come and and uh, accepted the invite from Kathy and, and uh, thought we'd talk about it a little bit. And, and uh, putting together the information, it, it's, it's kind of in storybook form. But we have to go back a little bit and talk about how the genesis of the project and how it, how it developed and how it changed and then, and then how we uh, hit the reset button and changed it back. So uh, the, the first thing I want to talk about is, is the ferries. I think everyone knows we have 11, 11 vessels in the fleet. And the thing we don't talk about very much is the class of vessels. And, and there's, about, there's three classes. One's, one's the one we call the mainliners. And those do the heavy haul for us. They're, they're a 24-7 boat. Uh, they, they take the, the heavy equipment and, and uh, reliable boats long term, visit each port. And uh, they're also the most expensive. They have, a, uh, they have to have multiple crews on board and, and uh, upwards of about 50 people to man a, man a mainline vessel. The second class is what we call the Aurora class. They're the smaller vessels. They go to the villages. L big difference there is they don't have staterooms for um, uh, travelers, but they do have staterooms for uh, crew members, and they can accommodate multiple crews. So they're kind of like the mama bear, where they're um, not as expensive as a mainliner to operate, but, uh, but almost as much. And, and multiple crews, probably about 28 people at a time, 23 to 28 people, I believe. And then the third class of vessels we have are, are what we call the shuttle ferries. And these are the ferries that start out in one port in the morning, go to another community and return that day. And um, examples of that are the, Chine the Chiniga Fast Ferry, Chiniga Fast Ferry, Fairweather. We have the Latuya down in Metlakatla. And then the IFA has the Inter, the Inter Island uh, Ferry Authority has the Prince of Wales that, that goes between Ketchikan and Prince of Wales. Now these, these vessels are... Uh, really have a distinct mission. They're, they're, in general, there's, there aren't any crew quarters. They're set up for a day operation, and a day, by definition, is 12 hours. If you go over 12 hours, you're starting to look at multiple crews. So fast ferries offer the, the best service at the cheapest price. And I think we have a history of those. I think in Ketchikan or Metlakatla, the Latuya is very well, well thought of. And same with the IFA. Um, so, Born from the Southeast Plan and also the Juno Access Project, in 2006, we started going out looking for a new vessel to replace the Malaspina. And it wasn't going to be a mainline vessel. It was going to be a series of shuttle ferries. And we went out, we went out for a, uh, what we call a request for proposals. And um, we wanted to get into our system a true roll-on, roll-off ferry. That's a ferry where um, there's a bow door. The, ve the vessel, the vehicles load in one end of the ferry. They go to another port. They exit through the opposite side. So they, in, in Juneau, they could, they could load from the stern. The vehicles would get off in, say, Haines, go out the bow, load through the bow in Haines, and then in Juneau, when it returns, come out through the stern. <clears throat> Very efficient. And the reason I'm using Juno and Haynes as an example is what we were looking for was uh, a vessel that could, could uh, take care of the communities where we can put in a hub and spoke system where they were just on the verge of being a 12 hour day. And, and Haynes is that, uh, is that port from, from Juno. So we went out, put out the, uh, the RFP and, and specifically said there shall be a bow door opening and a stern uh, opening and then one on each side. And I think if you look at the main line, or I think most people have traveled the ferries, when, when you're loading a ferry down this, through the side door, the vehicles have to turn and when you get a longer vehicle on there like an RV or a, or a semi truck or something, it takes some time. It, it can take five, ten minutes to get one vehicle on the, on the boat. So the idea is you, you, you put them on, you take them off, and you turn that you turn that boat around in you know a half hour, say in Haines. So this became this started the process to get Alaska's first row row, roll on, roll off ferry through the stern and bow, since we had the Bartlett. We, we uh, I can't remember when we retired the the Bartlett, but it must have been the early 2000s or so. Um, 
the price estimate at that time was in the RFP was about 25 to 30 million dollars for one vessel. We hired a naval architect firm, Elliott Bay Design Group, and they began work on the on the project. But as the project took over and uh, we started going through the you know the public involvement process and the things started getting tweaked, subtle changes happened to the vessel. The bow door came off. When the bow door came off, we lost the row row. We lost the efficiency we were looking for. That was the number one issue. Crew quarters were added. Well, when we had a crew quarters, we lost the, um, the emphasis to make it a day boat. It could turn into more than a day boat with multiple crews and another expensive uh, a ferry. The length increased to 350 feet. And then more importantly, I guess the most important thing is the, the price estimate went up to $120 million. And this all happened under the, the watch of the department. I'm not exactly sure of... Uh, all the factors that went into it, but it was just one of those things that people were brought along, and, and, and that's just how the uh, how the ferry developed. Um, in 2010, the legislature, through mostly Senator Stedman, I believe, appropriated 60 million dollars for the ferry, and the following year, another 50 million dollar or 60 million dollars came in. So we did have the money in hand to build the build the vessel, and we used state funds. And the reason we used state funds was that gave us a little more, more flexibility with building the ship. It was the governor's and legislators' intent to build that vessel in Ketchikan at the Ketchikan shipyard. We we're going to get jobs out of the deal, and it was just a good thing all the way around, rather than rather than building it on the on the Gulf Coast. In parallel with this, in 2007, Commissioner Von Schaben went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Dr. Paul Metz, and commissioned a, uh, oh, what they call it, a uh, Marine Highway Systems Analysis, I think was the title of it. And uh, they worked on that. That was, that was released in 2011. And what that basically said was, hey, what you're getting isn't going to improve the efficiency of the Marine Highway System. If you replace the Malaspina, with an ACF, an Alaska class ferry in Lynn Canal, you, you aren't getting any benefit out of it. And then it further went on and said, if you replace two mainline ferries, the Taku and the Malaspina, with three Alaska class ferries, you're getting marginal, a marginal increase in uh, service and efficiency, but at a price of about $7 million more annually. <clears throat> so, in late 2011, we were getting concerned about just about everything. It was kind of congealing. We had a new administration in, uh, and we were concerned that it, that it was diverging away from the original intent. In fact, it really diverged away from the original intent, of course. But the rumor started coming in from the shipyard and from others that the, the cost was going to exceed $120 million. And um, so the departments were concerned at that time, fully a year ago, we were scratching our heads with this vessel. Didn't have enough information though to really really make a, any kind of a move. We did uh, enter into a contract with the, with the shipyard in Ketchikan in April and we're under what we call a CMGC procurement. That's where you have a consultant designing the vessel but you bring the shipyard in early and the shipyard has a hand in the design and, and you, you save costs and you build efficiencies and you re reduce your risk of, uh, of, of overruns and, and things like that. So finally, in the fall of 2012, we'd reached a point where we could get accurate estimates on the new vessel. And those estimates far exceeded 120 million. We were up uh, around 150 to 167 million. We, we got an estimate from the consultant, we got an estimate from the shipyard. And we knew that uh, you just couldn't lop feet off the Alaska class ferry and save that much money. You know, you have to have the same engine in it. You have to have a door. You know, things like that. So, we were we were in a predicament. So at that time, we were faced with a with a vessel that didn't meet the original intent of a shuttle ferry roll on roll off efficiency. We had a university study that was dubious about the the efficiency of a boat and the cost of, of the new boat we had gone to, and then we were far over the estimate. We took that information to the governor, and the governor said, boy, take a close look at this, come into some recommendations, and, and we did that. 
went back to the governor and he said, we've got to hit the reset button with this. And that's a, that's a, kind of what we've been saying, is hitting the reset button and, and take a good look at what we have done, how the project had morphed so much and, and what we can do about it. And what we came back with was we need to go back to the original concept. We need to go and get a highly efficient roll-on, roll-off vessel. Uh, it'll better serve the, uh, uh, the, the system and it'll be a lot cheaper to build and operate. Um, the vessel will be, as we see it, it'll be about 260 to 300 feet in length. So it's bigger than the Aurora class. It's bigger than the uh, Lacani and, and uh, the Aurora. Uh, it'll hold about 50 cars. The Lacani holds about 35. Uh, it will not have passenger or crew staterooms. And uh, it'll be design, designed with a stern and bow loading. This vessel is expected to have the same sea keeping abilities as the Taku. There's been a lot of talk about a little dinky, um, I think Senator Stedman said a dory, a dory with a sail. <laughs> and I, I, uh, that's not the case. This is going to be a, 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 a big vessel. It'll, have, it'll be a little narrower because, uh, because you can load from the ends and the front. You don't have to have the room, the width to turn as you come on through a side door. It's going to be uh, just a, a better vessel for us in the long runs. And we hope to build two of them for the, within the $120 million appropriation. Um, I know some people have questioned the, the wisdom of this and they're uh, hitting us hard with a lot of theories and, and uh, you know, saying uh, sky's falling, stuff like that. And I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think we've got a good vessel in hand. And I think uh, when the facts come out, and we'll, we'll get reading from a fact sheet right here that we're doing on how the, how the thing changed, we'll, uh, you'll understand what we're doing. And, and the negative comments should be uh, should be neutralized. Um, next steps, uh, we're going to uh, we're working with the Elliott Bay Design Group right now. We're changing the scope of the contract with them. We're going to have the same consultant do the work. It's our full intent to have the shipyard do the work. I was down there the other day and uh, met with one of the leaders of the of the shipyard, and I said, "What's the most cost efficient way to do this? How do we get these things built down here?" And he said, he said that what we need to do is build them side by side in their new facility. You bring in the steel cutting people, you cut the steel for the first vessel. While the steel cutting people are, and the equipment are still there, you, you, uh, you cut the steel for the second one. So there'll be about a three month lag behind to build these two vessels. One, one will hit the water, three months later, the other one will hit the water. And uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, I, I think we did the right thing, I think the governor you know, I think it's good government when you can step back and take a look at what you've done and you have the courage to say, oh boy, I'm not so sure this was the right thing to do. And we hit the reset button and, and the, the governor should really be applauded for that. I, I, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, guts, I guess, to, to do something like that. And, and uh, it is the right thing to do. So um, that's the story. I thought it should be in a story format, like I said, because it, it has... It's, a, um, it's been a six years epic, I guess, how this whole thing came about. Uh, what we're doing now, uh, we're basing this vessel on the, on the, Juno, the needs for the Juno Access Project. Um, you know, on the, on the Juno Access Project, there's a, a shuttle ferry system at Katsahin and that takes uh, vehicles and passengers to Haines and Skagway. When, when the uh, avalanche hazard is high enough, the intent is to run that vessel down Lynn Canal when traffic demand is very low in the winter and, and close the roadway until it can be, the avalanche mitigation can be done, then open the roadway back up. So it's designed for that. It can be used elsewhere. These vessels will go out to icy straits. They'll go um, anywhere where we can put in a 12-hour day. Uh, one concept might be that we can take these vessels and make a run to a community that, where it takes 10 or 12 hours to get to it, leave it there overnight, and bring it back. I mean, that's even a possibility. It's just, uh, we think there's more utility. We're going to offer um, two-thirds more capacity each day in Lynn Canal. There'll be multiple runs, and there'll be um, uh, different times of the day you can go. So you have more opportunity to travel, more flexibility. Um, 
in the uh, in Lynn Canal specific, I always default to Lynn Canal because it, it seems like the perfect model. But you could have a vessel in um, in uh, Haines and Juneau, and they could both start out in the morning for the for the their respective communities. So they get they get the Haines vehicle get, or vessel gets to Juneau at uh, noon or whatever. Then it heads northbound. The Juno the Juno population has another opportunity to travel north, not at, at six in the morning or, or what have you. So I, I think there's a lot of flexibility, and uh, I'm, I'm just positive we did the right thing. So thank you. Some questions, Mr. Campbell out there. Laurie? Well, as Senator Stedman mentioned, um, uh, Laurie Gardner, um, Senator Stedman mentioned that it would be like a, a dory. Uh, has the narrower design been tested in um, southeast waters? Well, good question. <laughs> uh, I, I guess not, you know. Uh, Theoretically, we have the Latuya. The, 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 the Latuya is kind of the same whole form one, that one consultant submitted. There's been some other um, other submittals that came in initially with the original RFP, and one of them looked like a Washington State ferry with bows, and it had it had propulsion at each end. I don't know. That, that's for the designers to figure out. Um, one of the reasons we moved so quickly to, for this change was we were we were going to start doing tank tests for the. Uh, the original ACF in, in Norway in October. And that, that was another reason why we moved so fast. We wanted to not have to ship all our people over there to Norway to do the test. But that, that kind of testing will be done on the new vessel, too, of course. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Pat. Um, I'm curious, this new design, will it work with the existing ground facilities at Ames and Tennessee and everywhere else, or does it require the modifications to the dock? Bruce, I think the only thing we have to worry about now is, is to put in a stern loading um, facility in Haines. We have a stern loading facility out here. Um, uh, we have to put one in Haines. And then uh, Skagway, uh, if, if we put a shuttle ferry between Skagway and Haines, I, we don't have to have that many trips. I think we can load vehicles through the side doors in Skagway. And um, so everything else should fit. Uh, we don't have to make a, any kind of a modification like we did the fast ferries for the terminals. If, when you get on a fast ferry, you notice that big ramp as you go up the, the ferry. Well, that was to fit our docks. And that, and that won't be necessary with this vessel. There you go. Commission, would it save some time and fuel and add to the efficiency to have a, a small terminal at Cascade Point since the road's going all, all, all that way now? Oh, definitely. The whole mantra of the Southeast plan is to extend roads, reduce ferry links. That way we get multiple trips, better, better traveling. Of course, that project, though, is wrapped up in the Juneau Access EIS. And quite frankly, we can't do anything like that until the EIS is, uh, is completed and calls for some, uh, it gives us some alternatives. Thank you. Yeah. Ben? Oh. Hi, so on my way to work this morning, I was listening to the report about the Derek Tur litigation that's going on down at the Diamond Courthouse. And knowing you were speaking today, I just couldn't help but wonder, has this reset uh, made it less likely that there's going to be litigation with Elliott Bay? And is there any sort of a sense that they did anything wrong as the naval architects for the state that led to where we are now? Or is, 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 do you think litigation will be avoided? And you may not be able to comment, but I, I couldn't help but wonder. No, absolutely not, Ben. We, we let them down the path. We, we, we just went this way, and uh, uh, no, they're, they're on board, and, and they're doing a good job for us, and, and uh, I know we can turn this thing around, and I'm pretty certain that we will have vessels in the water under the same time frame that we would have had them under the original concept. Smaller, easier to build, faster to build. So, yeah. Hey, Jim. Pat, uh, since it's been designed for the Lynn Canal run, and those of us who have been on the work on the water know how rough the water is. I would expect that it's designed for that piece of water. It can go anywhere in southeast Alaska, you say, as a state. You know, I, um, I said the same thing the other day to somebody. I can't remember who it was, but yeah, right. If we can get it through Lynn Canal, I think we can get it through anything. I, I'm not a <laughs> seafarer, though, but that's, um, it's kind of funny. On the trip back from Ketchikan with the governor, 
uh, it was a couple of days after Lacani went to Haynes and everyone was having motion sickness problems and and I looked down and there was Lacani coming up uh, uh, either Stevens pa uh, Stevens Passage and uh, I wouldn't want to been on that boat <laughs> 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 yeah hey Kat. I've had the opportunity to follow this whole thing since the 2007 we were appointed to the Marine Transportation Advisory Board. And we, the, the AMTAP board originally um, made the recommendation to the legislature and the governor to start a vessel replacement fund. It had been talked about before, but we made that recommendation. And that recommendation, we recommended that money go toward building a shuttle slash day boat type ferry. And over the last six years, I've watched this whole project morph into this huge boat. I mean, people, there was so much public comment, and every time DOT would give us a presentation and show us the plans for this Alaska class ferry, it kept getting bigger, and it had more amenities. It had, you know, originally there wasn't gonna be any state rooms, and then there was crew quarters, and then there was sick rooms, and then there was rooms for the elderly, and all those things, of course we want all that stuff, but what we're trying to do is save money in our, uh, for our marine highway. The whole state pays so much for this public transportation method we have. And when the governor announced that, I was so pleased because we're finally, somebody finally said, wait a minute, and they're taking it back to what the original plan was. It's, this is to save money and to improve our infrastructure in Southeast Alaska. And that's what he did, he pulled it back and I think it's, I think they couldn't have done anything better. I just want to say. Yes, uh, Commissioner, would you be able to stay in your car like a traditional roll-on roll ferry? And what's the estimated speed this ferry would have? You know, when I was a kid, first first riding the ferries, I don't know, probably some of the older people here remember, we used to be able to stay in your car, sleep in your car. We were all bummed out when that went away. No, you, you can't do that with Coast Guard regulations. You have to, you'll have to go up on above. I think the Ketchikan Airport shuttle is the last, last boat where you can do that. On uh, what was the other question? Uh, uh, estimated speed. Right. The engineers will figure that out. In, in the original, uh, the original RFP, I believe they had a. There's a, a sprint speed and a uh, cruise speed. The original was at 18 knots and then a 20 knot sprint, sprint speed. But but what it, what it comes down to is the time in port. That that's where we get killed. We're we're, we're our most efficient when that boat is moving. And and uh, so the speed will come about. I, I've heard 16 and a half knots will do it. And I, I don't know. That's for the naval architects and engineers. Yeah. There's a Brad Flitch, Alaska Internet Network. Um, this is probably a 30 year commitment to this boat. What other fuel sources have you looked at other than diesel, or is that, I mean, we're talking about an LNG plant on the North Slope. Is there anything else that's even viable for a ferry system besides diesel? Brad, that's really for the engineers. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, we got one guy here that says a sail will work, so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, it's diesel, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. One guy, one senator here. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Um, in the paper, it was mentioning uh, the, this, this, these smaller ferries are much more easier to be built or more likely to be built in the Ketchikan shipyard. And I mean, a lot of us want to support jobs in our region. Can you give a little bit on that? I, I don't know what kind of job creation or what that impact is uh, for the community of Ketchikan. I believe the shipyard told me it would be about 300 jobs for that for a couple years. But the governor, I, I was surprised how the, the governor was, was very um, clear with Ketchikan. We, and we're kind of in a catch-22. We want the jobs to be in Alaska. But we also want to get a, a fair price. And, and under the CMGC concept, we, we'll negotiate a price. And if we don't like the price, we think we can go elsewhere, we'll put it out for competitive bid. And, and that's, that's kind of our, I don't, know, I don't want to say hammer, it's our, it's our leverage, I guess, to ensure that we get a good price. I'm fully confident the shipyard will come through. They, that, that is a good crew down there, and, and you'll be impressed by the shipyard. Um, I, 
I, I think we're in good shape. Um, and they and they know they, they know that it's going to be competitive. They they don't they don't have a lock on it. Um, close to a lock, but not a full lock. You know, we, we'll, we'll sit down and, and at the end we'll negotiate this thing out. Senator, just um, maybe mention how viable it would be to use it from Prince Rupert to Ketchikan. That was another short run that you guys were looking at. Is that still in the works? Or? No, that, it wouldn't work there because of the solus requirements. And um, we'd have to use one of our existing vessels for that. So, yeah. That's one thing the original concept would have done. It became a solus vessel also. Yes? You mentioned the increased efficiency this vessel would provide. And pretty much the whole presentation has been about between Haines and Juneau. What other ports are going to see increased service? Is SIPC going to see increased service? Can some of the ports that are a little further away from Juneau that currently don't have great ferry service? Good question. I, you know, we're, if we're going to be under a 12 hour uh, day, you can figure it out for yourself. I, I think Huna would be a good candidate. I don't know if we can pick up Huna and Gus Davis in one day, in 12 hours. Uh, so that, that's what I mean when I say icy straits, uh, Elfin Cove. Uh, Sitka, Sitka is, gives us a little bit of problem because of Surges Narrows. The, the best vessel for that is our fast ferry. The fast ferry solved a, a lot of ills for service to Sitka. And I think we, we, put, we put pretty good service in there now. But um, redundancy factors. It could substitute for the Latuya if, when the Latuya has to go into a dry dock. It could help the IFA or if, if uh, they needed some help. And then um, the uh, scenario I gave you just a little bit earlier about a one-way trip. You know, that just came up the other day in the brainstorming. I, I don't know if that'll come to fruition or not, but that possibility is there too. Then we have Prince William Sound. Um, tell you the truth, I'm not sure about the time run between Valdez and Cordova, but it might, it might work there. Uh, but but we have that. I can't remember if that if we're using the Aurora as a shuttle ferry up there or not right now. But but we I think we can do that with a shuttle ferry in that in Prince William Sound. Hey Bruce. Uh, Pat, can you explain what solace means? It's a safety of life at sea. It's a uh, it's rec it's uh, requirements we have to match fire keeping requirements and safety requirements. It, it, this was a big deal to us 10, 15 years ago where we had to bring all our ships up to Solus capability that, that went through Prince Rupert. And, um, and that's still a requirement. And, uh, and it's costly and there's a lot of training with it. It's just another thing you have to do to maintain a good system. If I could just, what you were talking about with <coughs> other ports get more service. The, what they would, what those shuttle boats would do, those day boats would allow the other ferries to service other ports more often, and that's what we're trying to do. Is Sitka doesn't get enough, and when you know the fast ferry can't go there, then it takes forever to get to the outside of Sitka. So it just frees up the bigger ships to do those longer runs. Yeah, and, and one thing I might add, this does not eliminate the uh, the mainliner run. This supplements the mainliner. Old Big Blue is still going to be running up the canal until we can get that road in place. So, yeah. Carl? Uh, what does it look like, what's the schedule look like for replacing <coughs> the other uh, older vessels and what is the configuration to replace them? The existing mainliners? Well, first off, we hope to, ex we hope to replace mainliners with this class of shuttle ferries. How many we can really replace? Not known. One for sure, maybe two. We're always going to need mainliners. They're always going to go from Bellingham out the chain. Um, the one thing, uh, I'll speak cautiously to this, is the Ketchikan shipyard has, has helped the marine highway system quite a bit since, since they've been getting a lot of our work. And, and one, of the, one of the things that appears to me is, is I think we're getting more confidence in our ability to keep our mainliners running. Um, we have a shipyard right next door we're confident in them, uh, and, and I, I'm getting that from Captain Falvey. We, we've actually talked about that quite a bit, because 15 years ago, you know, the Malaspina was dead. We had to replace it. We had to get the Kennecott. Well, we got the Kennecott, and the Malaspina is still chugging up and down the, the system. So I, I think there's been a paradigm shift with, with our thoughts on the mainliners. I mean, they can't last forever, but I, I, think we, 
I think they can last a little bit longer. Our next immediate concern, though, is, is probably the uh, Tustamina. Uh, that's an ocean-going vessel. It's been, uh, it's been taking the roughest water for 45 years, and I think we're kind of eyeballing that as the next big uh, uh, capital investment for us. <coughs> Yeah, there'll have to be some kind of a shuffle in the morning. Uh, obviously, two stern boats or two two bow stern loading boats couldn't be in the in the uh, the fast ferry terminal right now. One will have to be alongside the main dock, and then and then they'll have to do a shuffle in the morning. I don't see any real other improvements out at Ock Bay. I think we're maxed out there with our neighbors. Um, so. I, what, what is the, our operations people will take care of that, I'm sure. Hey, John? What's the status of the environmental analysis or impact statement on the long dreamed of road to Skagway? Okay, uh, this change will, will delay that project a little bit, probably delay it about a month, maybe two months. We were looking at putting out a draft EIS in, uh, I think it was February or March, and it, it'll probably be March or April now. Um, uh, because we have to write this, this particular vessel into the plan for the different options um, versus the previous ACF. So um, let's see, take a little bit further. So we'll have a record of decision probably uh, maybe January of uh, well, probably a year from now, two thirteen, early early two two thousand fourteen, I guess, be a good approximation. And was that the EIS you were talking about that would allow Cascade Point to be developed? Yes. Jesse, Pat, I guess uh, the question in my mind is, uh, it, this this approach. It, when design costs got higher than they were initially expected, taking the line back to front line. Is that, is that a rule that's going to apply to all transportation projects in the state, say bridges and thick arm? Well, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different. Uh, oh, Knick Arm, Kabata? <laughs> that's real different. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a whole different animal with the bonding and, and stuff. Uh, I take it to mean the, the regular federal aid program. Yeah. That, that's. Uh, you know, at one time I described this this morphing of this Alaska class ferry as as what happens to us with highways. We go out to a public meeting on a highway, uh, and all of a sudden people want sidewalks on both sides of the road. They want they want four lanes. They want separated bike paths. They want lighting. They want all these different things. And pretty soon your project is so expensive you can't do everything, so you end up building a little section. And the difference with federal aid is, is there's this bucket of money out there that we get each year, almost a half billion dollars. And, and we can do that with those types of projects. We, we, can, we can add money to those projects. If this was a federal project, theoretically, we could add money to this project. We'd have to delay another project. One in Juneau might be delayed for one in uh, Petersburg or Sitka or something. But um, with, this, with this project, we had $120 million, and the governor, quite frankly, didn't want to go back for more. We, we were on a mission at the beginning, and we lost our focus, and uh, we hit the reset button. So a little bit different animal. Yes. And maybe Kathy can answer this one, too, but with, with the increase in the fleet, is there some thought, you know, you mentioned basically both possibly out of Haines and having them cross paths. Are any of the other small communities possibly going to benefit from this? Like Puna, you know, has an economy that would be improved by having a ferry base there. Uh, Sitka as well. You know, and, and when the fast ferries were first introduced, there had been talk of basing fast ferries in other ports. Is that something you guys have even looked at yet, or is it too soon? 
rather than shuffling in Juno, having inbound ferries coming in? That will probably come out in the, in the updated Southeast Transportation Plan. Uh, that's probably the best vehicle for that. Fast ferries, I don't know what their, their future is. You know, we're having problems with the engines. I hope we can get that cleaned up because, as I mentioned, Sitka, it's critical for Sitka, the fast ferry uh, with the tide band there, um, and Prince William Sound with Mr. Chiniga. So um, I think, I think it would be a, a function of the southeast plan and, and, and what vessels we have and how we're going to up, update them. But the whole genesis behind this project is it's not, it's not so much the cost, it, it, it's the efficiency and the opportunity to travel, the capacity. You know, clearly in Lynn Canal, we don't offer enough capacity to travel. There's a, a far greater demand to travel than what we can do with our vessels. And, um, and it's, that, it's that way everywhere. Um, you know, you're, you're limited with vessels. And, uh, you know, you got the cost, you got the frequency, you got the capacity, you got the opportunity. And, uh, th and that's why I said if we can lengthen roads, shorten ferry runs, we're, we're in a lot better shape. So, and I think the Southeast Plan will bear that out.